and we're going to look at unlock your spiritual gifts. It's, you know, we'll see how, you know, what the Bible talks about spiritual gifts and um, maybe one or two ways on how we can unlock uh, our spiritual gifts. So we'll just go straight to the Bible verse, the Bible verse reading for today. And I'll be reading from 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 12, and I'll be reading from 1 to 11. It looks like a long one, but I promise it won't be that long. Um, Now, 1 Corinthians 12, from verse 1 to 11, and I read from verse 1. Now, concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles carried away to these dumb idols, however you were led. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus a cost, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Spirit. Now, there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are difference of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, And I go to verse 9. It says, To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healings by the same Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the sending of spirits. To another, different kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. Verse 11. And it says, But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. Distributing to each one individually as he wills. Now, a bit of background as to why this scripture was written to a particular church. Now, this scripture verse was written to the church at Corinth. It was written by Paul, Apostle Paul. You all know him, right? Apostle Paul famous apostle in the Bible. Now, Apostle Paul found it, you know, he, he, he found it important to write to the church at Corinth, okay? Very important to write to the church at Corinth. Now, a bit of background, because the church in Corinth at that time were passing through so many issues. There are a lot of issues. Now, Paul was the founder of that church in Corinth. Now, Corinth is the present-day Greece. Like, you know, well, it was still in Greece then, but it was a kingdom in Greece, right? So that was a church in that time. Um, and Paul was the founder of this church, okay? Now, he came into this region in Corinth, and I think he spent about 18 months with them, and he founded a church, right? He, you know, led many to Christ, founded the gathering and people, and he, you know, taught people how to worship God, how to pray. He taught them about the Holy Spirit, right? And he set them up in a good way before he left. And if you know Paul from his teachings, you realize that Paul was a man that was passionate about the things of the Spirit. He was quite passionate. He loved spiritual things. He loved spiritual gifts. He was so passionate that he went to a certain region at some point in Ephesus and he came to a garden of people and he asked them, have you received the Holy Spirit? And, and the believers told him, we've not even heard of the Holy Spirit. We've not heard of the Holy Spirit. Paul said, what? You've not heard of the Holy Spirit? That's strange. Then he asked them, into what baptism were you baptized into? And they said, oh, we're baptized into John the, by John the Baptist. And Paul said, okay, no, no, that's not the end, Right? But John the Baptist only made way for the Savior that would come to baptize with the Holy Spirit, right? So he was that passionate that he would literally go into anywhere and he would talk about the things of God and he would talk about the spirit things of God. So he was passionate about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now he felt the need to write to the church about spiritual gifts because the church in Corinth at that time, after he left them, they became confused, they became confused. Even though he taught them about the Holy Spirit, 
they were, they were confused because they started misusing the gifts of the Holy Spirit. It was mis- they were there were there were many things, right? In fact, if, if you read through the Bible properly, you realize that the church at Corinthians were one of the most problematic church at that time. Many issues, many issues that Paul had to address, right? So he was somewhere else, and someone they, they brought reports to him and said, "Oh, this is what's happening in this church. That's what's happening." So he had to write to them. He had to write to them. Now, if I take you back to the if I take you back to the first verse, or rather, if I go straight to some problems with the church at Corinth, right? So, you know, some, some problems with the church at Corinth. Like I'm trying to say, they had too many issues. There were divisions and factions among them. There were misuse of the spiritual gifts. You know, they misused that um, in a way that when Paul had the report, he wasn't happy, right? They had lawsuits among themselves. What well, that means, they were fighting among themselves. So there were, they were, they were divisions in the church, and Paul had to address that, right? In fact, at some point, many of them were saying, oh, I'm, I'm of Paul. <laughs> my, my Christianity is Paul's Christianity. <laughs> some had to say, oh, no, my, my, my Christianity is Apollos. Some say, oh, my Christianity is Peter. Some say, oh, my Christianity is Christ. And Paul was confused. He was confused, right? Now, 1 Corinthians 1, 10 to 13, Paul had to write to them in that scripture. He said, no, I plead with you, right, brethren, the next slide. Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas, who is, no, that's Peter, and I'm of Christ. He had to ask them a question. He said, is Christ divided? Now I ask you, is, is Christ divided? No. Christ, Christ cannot be divided. Okay? Now, he asked him another question. Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? No. So, Paul was kind of, all these divisions is not necessary. Because Christ is not divided. The body of Christ shouldn't be divided. And it's not divided. Okay, so he was trying to address one of the many issues with it, you know, at the church of Corinth. Divisions, confusions, the misuse of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now I take you back to the scripture that we started. I take you back to the beginning of the scripture. Now that you have this background of why Paul had to write to that church. Divisions, confusions, misusing the gifts of the Spirit. He had to write again to them. Again to them, you have to write to them now in a more serious tone, right? Now concerning spiritual gifts, I do not want you to be ignorant. Don't be ignorant. You, you receive this, you're a believer, born again, you receive the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit is in you. But concerning the things of the Spirit, the gifts that come with that Spirit, you shouldn't be ignorant of it. You should know those spirits, those gifts, what they do, and you should know how those gifts should manifest in you. Now, you were once Gentiles. Again, just like Paul will always write, if you go through the scripture, realize that Paul was an apostle, but it seemed like he was an apostle to the Gentiles, while Peter was an apostle to the Jews, right? Now, to the Jews and the Gentiles. Now, the Jews were, of course, historically they knew the laws, right? They followed the laws. They knew the laws of Moses, the Mosaic law, the Judean law. So, you know, they were literally people who, from birth, they followed the law of the books. But the Gentiles were people who had no issues, no, no idea what, what, what the law was all about, right? They didn't care. But later on, they gave their life to Christ. So Paul was actually looking after a church of people who had no idea about the laws of Moses. You see? So they didn't have that background. They didn't care about it. They didn't follow those laws. They just, some of them were pagans. Some of them were idol worshippers. They just came from all those sects. And they gave their life to Christ. So they were new beings. Now imbibed with the spirits. But confused 
and misuse the issues of the spirits. Now you were carried away by these dumb idols, however you were led. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus a cost. No one speaking by the Spirit of God will say Jesus is a cost, definitely not. And no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Spirit. Now there are diversities of gifts. In case you don't remember, in case you don't know, there are different types of gifts, but it is the same Spirit that gives these gifts. There are differences of ministries, but it is the same Lord. It's the same Jesus, same church, but they're different ministries. Different ministries. So there shouldn't be any conflicts of interest. You shouldn't feel bad if your ministry is not the same as the next person. No. No. It's just different ministries. The same Lord, the same purpose, the same aim, the same goal, walking towards Christ. That's it. The same thing, but difference in it. But, and there are diff- diversities in activities, but it is the same God. Take note, he, in this passage, he talked about the Trinity. Diversity of gifts, same spirit. Diversities of ministries, same Lord. Diversities of activities, but the same God. Holy Spirit, Jesus, and God. Walking together, not in division. Not in confusion. Not in all forms of, you know, issues that are not important for the ministry. Issues that are not important to Christians. No. There should be no divisions. There should be no confusion. The same spirits, different gifts. The same Lord, different ministries. The same God, different activities. One church, different people. Different things, different gifts, different activities, different ministries, but walking towards the same purpose, you and me, in love, but one God, one power, one spirit. Amen? He had to remind them these things because they forgot. They had forgotten. They were overzealous. They were confused. They decided to misuse a lot of things. Now verse 7, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one of you for the profit of all. The manifestation of the Spirit. To manifest in the Spirit. To demonstrate issues relating to the Spirit. That is the manifestation. To demonstrate the power of God through the Spirit. It is given to you, me, Each one, though differently, though diverse, but it is for the profits of the church. The profit of the church. Not for my personal gain. Not for your personal profit. Not for you to feel good about yourself. No. But for the profit of the church. To build the church. To build the kingdom of God. He had to remind them that. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit. Now he, he tried to start listing the different gifts of the Spirit. Okay? Now, for to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit. To another, the word of knowledge through the same Spirit. And verse 9, to another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healings by the same Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the sending of spirits. To another, different kinds of tongues. So another the interpretation of tongues, and but one and the same spirit works in all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. These gifts, the key issues, these gifts, different gifts, diverse in nature, but they're distributed to every one of us, every one of you. Yes, you, listen to my voice. You have one of these gifts, minimum one. Some of you can have five, ten. You never know yet. Until you unlock those gifts in you. You have to unlock it. You have to, you can unlock it. That's the key. You have to unlock the spiritual gifts. You can unlock it. That is how the Holy Spirit manifests in us. With power. Not for profit, not for personal glory. But 
for the church, to profit the church of God, to profit the people of God. Amen? Amen. And that's it. I will just take you to a summary of the spiritual gifts very quickly on slide seven. A summary of the spiritual gifts, okay? Just a quick summary of the spiritual gifts. Now, if you go through the Bible, 1 Corinthians 12, from 4 to 11, or Romans 12, 6 to 8, you would see, you know, where Paul talked about these gifts, okay? Now, he talked about the word of wisdom, which literally means ability to apply spiritual truths practically. Word of wisdom. You remember Solomon had that. Someone like Solomon had this wisdom. Solomon was a wise man. Very wise. He, you know, at some point, God asked him, what should I give to you? He said, no, no, just, what did he say? Wisdom. Give me wisdom that I might lead your people aright. He asked for this wisdom. Now that's a gift. The spiritual gift. Paul had that gift. Peter had that gift. This is a spiritual gift that comes through the unction and manifestation of the Spirit. Paul also talked about the gifts of the word of knowledge. Deep understanding of divine truths. Understanding of divine truths. Now, Daniel had that. Daniel was able to interpret dreams that he did not know about. That was not natural. Nebuchadnezzar told him, no. He told people, no, I, I will not tell you the dream. <laughs> I will not tell you, but interpret it to me. And the other sorcerers were like, what? Why, why do you say that? How can you not tell us the dream? You should tell us so that we can interpret. But he was like, no, this time around, I won't say the dream. I need someone to tell me the dream and tell me the interpretation. That, under normal circumstances, is not possible. It's not possible. On the natural, it's not possible. It can only be possible through the Holy Spirit's gifts of the word of knowledge. And that's all. Daniel showed this. Amen. Daniel showed this. And he, interpreted, he told the dream, and he interpreted the dream. Paul also talked about the gift of faith, which is literally an extraordinary trust in God beyond ordinary faith. Beyond the ordinary faith. You know, the scripture always talked about faith. And he said, even if you have faith as little as a mustard seed, what, what will happen? You can move mouth. Just a little bit of faith, you can do the extraordinary. Now imagine the gift of of faith. <sighs> the gift of faith. Abraham had that. We know our father, Father Abraham. He had that faith. He trusted God in the way God told him, go and <laughs> you know, kill your son for me. Sacrifice your son. He had that trust and faith. Okay. This has to be God. Amen. This has to be God. Gift of healing. Gift of healing. The ability to heal various physical, emotional, or spiritual illness. It's a gift. It's a gift of healing. Last time we looked, when we looked at um, Empowered Witness and we looked at Peter, you know, we went through the timeline of Peter from when he was with, before he was with Jesus, when he was with Jesus, and after Jesus left. And we realized that in Acts of the Apostles chapter 3, Peter demonstrated he got to the point that he demonstrated after the Spirit had come, after the day of Pentecost, after Peter became bold, Peter demonstrated. Peter healed. And from that day, the trajectory of Peter was something different. Do you know a point came that the shadow of Peter was healing people, not him. The scripture recorded that people would bring out the sick on the streets. And Peter would just walk. Just his shadow was healing the sick. Not him anymore. He, he, he wasn't praying. He wasn't laying hands now. But his shadow, he was walking. And his shadow would, you know, he's just walking and his shadow is touching sick. And they're being healed. Extraordinary gift of healing. Peter had that after the Spirit came, of course. Paul had that. The prophets of, you know, Elisha and Elijah, they had that. Other men of God in the scripture, servants of God, they had this extraordinary gift. Gift of healing. 
Spiritual gift of healing. That's one or some of you, many of you have, if you can unlock those gifts. You also talked about the gift of miracles, supernatural acts of power. Supernatural is a different word. It's, miracle can be healing, but miracle can be other things. Many other things. Many other Do you know at some point, Peter, this same Peter, he resurrected the dead. He did resurrect the dead. He also performed the resurrection miracle. The same thing with Paul. At some point, Paul was ministering somewhere, and the scripture says his sermon was too long, and someone listened to his sermon standing somewhere fell. Maybe he was asleep. Asleep. And he fell down and he died. And Peter went there and resurrected that man. In fact, if you go through the scripture, only four persons in the scripture, apart from Jesus, actually performed the resurrection miracle. Peter, Paul, Elisha, and Elijah. Just those four. They resurrected the dead. In fact, Elisha's own was quite different. He also had that spirit of miracle. Elisha's own was different because at some point, even after his death, the scripture says they were carrying a dead man. And, you know, some people were carrying a dead man to go and bury that man. And raiders were trying to raid. And they just dropped the dead man into Elisha's tomb. And his body touched Elisha's bones. And what happened? He rose up. He rose up. The gift of miracle was so powerful in the life of Elisha that even his bones were raising the dead. Even his bones were raising the dead. That is unique. That is very unique. If I go to the next slide, you see Paul also talked about the gift of prophecy. The gifts of prophecy. <sighs> Prophet Elijah, um, Isaiah had that gift. Elijah had that. Paul had that. It's quite obvious. Speaking God's message under divine inspiration. That is prophecy. Speaking God's message, divine inspiration. Speak it out. And that's the manifestation of that gift. There's also a gift of discerning of spirits. Ability to distinguish between true and false spiritual influences. Of course, you know Paul had that. Peter had that, right? The Bible recorded at some point is, is a certain girl who had the spirit of divination. She followed, is it Paul? She followed Paul and I think Silas. She followed them and she was like, oh, these are, the men, these are men of God. These are men of God. And Paul had to rebuke her. I said, no, that, that is an evil spirit in you. He, he noticed it was an evil spirit. He had to rebuke. Paul had that spirit. Peter had that spirit. That gift. That is a gift, and it can be given to you. It can be given to me, right? Then there's the gift of tongues. Now, that gift was poured out to all apostles on Pentecost Day. The scripture says, the Holy Spirit descended on them as tongues of fire. And from that day, they had tongues. The gift of tongues were given to them. Ability to speak in languages unknown, to, even to the speaker. It's unknown to the speaker, and it's just the gift of tongues. And it's one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Then there is also the gift of interpretation of tongues. Understanding these tongues and what they mean, right? And actually, this was one of the problems with the church at Corinth that, Peter, that Paul had with them. Uh, many of them were exhibiting this gift of tongues, but exhibiting it openly in a gathering. And everyone was speaking in tongues. No one was interpreting. No one. How, how can we understand what you say? When you're speaking a language is unknown to us, it was a problem. And it was a, they, they were complaining about it. Paul had to address it. He said, no, you, you cannot just come together in the gathering and everybody is speaking in tongues. Everybody, who is interpreting? It means you're not complete. Because if there's a gift of tongues, someone should also have the gift of interpretation. You should have that gift of interpretation. So if there are gifts of tongues, where's the gift of interpretation? It is there. One of you have it. Some of you have it. All of you can just have the gift of tongues. <laughs> no, it's not. It's not balanced. And Christ's kingdom is balanced. Whatever Christ, whatever God does is balanced. He wouldn't just come and pour out one gift alone and say, okay, all of you, start speaking in tongues. Who is the interpreter? And he had to tell them, okay, if there's no interpreter amongst you, then no one should speak in tongues. Because it makes no sense. You're not edifying the body of Christ. You're only edifying yourself. Because you speak in tongues, unknown to all, was, 
is not profit in all. So interpretation of tongues is an important gift. And one of, some of us have it. Some of us, we don't even know we have it. We don't know we have it. We've not unlocked that part of us yet. Yet. But Paul wants you to unlock that part. And there's the gift of teaching, right? Ability to explain and apply truths of Scripture. And that's a gift. That's a gift. And there's the gift of encouragement. Ability to inspire and motivate. Some of us have that naturally, right? The gift of encouragement. But there's a gift. You can, in an unusual way, you can inspire and motivate others, right? There's also the gift of giving. The ability to contribute generously to God's work and to the needs of others. There's the gift of leadership, the ability to guide and direct with wisdom, vision, and integrity. Of course, the apostles had that. Paul had that. Peter had that. And many people you know in the Bible had that. Now, the gift of mercy, the ability to show deep compassion and care for those in need or suffering. These are gifts. Spiritual gifts, different gifts. I just listed about 14 of them approximately. Different gifts by the same Holy Spirit. Different, and is given to different, just as our faces are different, so are your gifts different. And God wants to remind you that you have some of these gifts. You need to unlock it. You need to manifest it. You need to trust the Holy Spirit to show you what gifts he has given to you because the Holy Spirit gives it willingly as he pleases. Now, if you are hiding your gifts or you do not seek to discover or activate your gifts, then you are not playing your role in transforming the church of God. You are hiding it. You do not seek to activate it. Then you are not playing your role because the gift of the Spirit helps to transform the church. Transform the church. The gift of the Spirit. It is not, I'm, I'm saying it is not possible that in a church of different people that you don't have all these gifts in those believers. It's, God is not a God of confusion. No, it is not possible. In a church with many believers, many brethren, some who have given their life many years ago, some of us who have given their life to Christ 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, Many believers, it's not possible that these gifts of the Spirit are not in this church. It's practically impossible. The only way it's possible is because many have not unlocked their gifts. Many have not unlocked their gifts. Many have not unlocked their gifts. Now, I ask you a question. If Paul, now, today, was to write to our church, if he was to write to our church, let's say he's somewhere now and he... He gets a report <laughs> of Ridgeway Community Church, Didcot. This is the, you know, he got the report of the church in Corinth. So he was in Ephesus and he got this report. He was quite far away and he got a report. He had to write to them. Now, wherever Paul is now, just imagine he's somewhere now and he gets a report of Ridgeway Community Church, Didcot. What do you think he will write back to us? And if he were to write to you a personal letter, what do you think he'll write to you? Sanelli? <laughs> Sorry, I picked your name already. First, first person I see. <laughs> so over here on my left. Zanelli? Why are you not using your gift of? Why are you not using your gift? He will write that out. Why are you not using your gifts? What are you doing? Why? Because he was a man passionate about gifts. He was passionate about the things of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit manifesting. And he would write to us, and he would, he would write, probably he write to me. I don't know what he said to me. <laughs> I, don't know what, I don't know what he might say to me, you know. Patrick. Oh no, Patrick, you're not doing well. <laughs> Probably that's what he's going to say. 
if he were to write to you now, to the church now, what will he say? What will he say? Are you going to tell him, I- I'm not even sure. I-, I, don't, I didn't know there are spiritual gifts. <laughs> that's what some of us, it's funny, but that's what some of us are saying. I, don't, I, I was not aware there are spiritual gifts. <laughs> not aware there are spiritual gifts. But they are spiritual gifts. To build the church, to edify the church, to build the kingdom of God. For the profit of the church, you must activate and unlock your gifts. You must activate and unlock your gifts. Can you tell your neighbor, just look at your neighbor and say, you have a spiritual gift. No, 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 no. no. I want you to say it like a minute. <laughs> say it like a minute. You have a spiritual gift. Some of you are not saying anything. You have a spiritual gift. You do have a spiritual gift. You have to unlock it. You have to unlock it. And you know, sometimes the issue of gifts is is like the parable of talents. The parable of talents. The scripture says, and the Lord gave to one five talents, to the other two, to the other one. And he expected them to make good use of this talent. The one he gave five, the scripture says he used it and he multiplied. He doubled it. He made another five. The one he gave two talents, what happened? He did the same. Got two more and he was happy. But the one he gave one talent, maybe that one felt it was too small. Why did you give me one talent? You gave him five, you gave me two. Five, two, one. Okay, maybe you didn't expect me to trade with it. That's what he thought. Okay, maybe he didn't expect me to do anything with it. And he was quite happy. With, oh, yes, ma- yes, yes, Lord, welcome. The one you gave me, I buried it. So that when you come, I, I give it back to you. He said, I knew, I knew you were a shred, you know, had, had, what language did he say? I, kn- I know you're a shred master. You reap where you do not sow. <laughs> he said, I know, you, I know you because you reap where you don't sow. So I hid it for you. And you know, each time I read through that scripture, just and read through that scripture later, I don't think that guy was doing it out of a bad intention. He, was, he, he thought in his mind, he thought he was doing the right thing. You see? Because he was happy to go to him and say, oh, yes, yes, Lord, welcome. Look at this talent you gave me. I actually hid it. Take note. He was trying to say he did not lose it. <laughs> he said, oh, yes, yes, I didn't lose it. I, I, I kept it. So that when you come, I give it back to you. And I'm sure he was expecting praise. <laughs> He was expecting a pat in the back. Well done. So he wasn't expecting what he got. That that is not the aim of giving you out a gift. Giving you a talent. I don't expect you to hold your talent, bury it, don't use it. And when I come back to ask of that talent, you tell me, oh, this is your talent, take it back. This is the gift you gave me, take it back. No. Scripture says, in this way, yes, that's why the scripture says, to him, who has more, more will be given. And to him who has none, even the little you have will be taken off, will be ripped off you. Because you don't appreciate that little, that one, that talent, that gift. Each and every one of us have a spiritual gift. We have one. Minimum, you have one. You need to know that there are spiritual gifts. You need to through the help of the Holy Spirit, sense which spiritual gift you have. You need to unlock it. You need to use it, not for your own personal gain, but for the church and to build the church. Now, in the whole, in the, you know, the funny thing about the day of Pentecost was this. I tell you the funny thing is that before that day of Pentecost, that wasn't the only day that the Holy Spirit descended upon people of God. Now, all if you go through scriptures in the Old Testament, you realize that the Holy Spirit, or the Spirit of God, like the way it was said in the Old Testament, the Spirit of God oftentimes will move upon people. It will come on people, and they will perform acts of God, unusual acts of God. Elisha did that, Elijah did that, many prophets, many you know, prophets in the Old Testament did that, even kings did that. So sometimes the Spirit of God will come, which is the Holy Spirit in reality. It will come on them and they will perform duties. 
Now, the key thing there is that the Holy Spirit, the role of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament was oftentimes temporal. Oftentimes it was for a specific purpose, right? It was selective. Oftentimes in the Old Testament, the, Holy Spirit, the, the Spirit of God will come, selective manner, it will come, you know, it can go to the prophet, it can go to Elijah, it can go to Elisha, it can go to someone else. It, 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 it didn't go on everyone, all, everyone at the same time, right? But after the day of Pentecost, it was no more selective. It was no more a temporary situation that the Holy Spirit would come and go. After the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was permanent on all believers. What that means is when you give your life to Christ now and you accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior and you are saved, immediately the Holy Spirit of God is in you. Scripture says, do you not know that your body is the temple of God? The Holy Spirit resides in you. Now, as we speak, you have that Holy Spirit. You only need to unlock the gifts that the Holy Spirit is willing to give to you. I bet some of you, the Holy Spirit has been knocking on your door. Man, accept this gift. Accept, pick, use it, use this, use this. And you just, you know, close the door of your ears. No, no, I don't want to, no, 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 that's not me. The Holy Spirit is in you, permanently in you, dwelling in you, and you have to unlock that spirit. Now, how do we unlock, okay, why should we unlock the spirit? Why should we unlock the spiritual gifts? Why should we unlock your spiritual gift? Number one, reason why you should unlock your spiritual gift out of everything I've said, number one is this. Because I'm sure you must have seen this coming. Yeah? Number one reason is because you have at least one gift. Take note, I'm not talking about the person sitting on your left or right. <laughs> I'm not talking about someone else. I'm talking about you. Yes, you. You. You listen to me now. You have at least one gift. I tell you something. Some of you, some of us, even have up to six, ten different gifts. Peter, of course, we we'll say because it's Peter, he exhibited more than ten gifts. The same thing with Paul. He exhibited more than 10 gifts. The same thing with, just go through the scripture. Go through the scripture. A lot of, a lot of apostles, a lot of um, you know, disciples of Christ, they exhibited a lot of gifts. So you have at least one. You have at least one. Now 1 Corinthians 12, 7 says, But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. Each one. The manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one. Everyone. Everyone has that gift. You have that gift. Not somebody else. Not just the pastor. Not just, oh, that's, that's for Pastor Will. That, that, that's, uh, although that's for the worship team. The worship team, they, they have this special gift that when they sing, my heart melts. When they sing, my heart just melts. No, it's not just the worship team that have that gift. It's not just the worship. It's not, that, it's not just people in the prayer team that have the gift of healing. No. It's not just them. You have a gift. You have at least one gift. At least one. Take note. You have a minimum of one. You don't have, you don't have zero. If, if you feel you have, or, you know, over the years, the devil have told you that lie that you have zero gifts. Today, break that lie. That is a lie from the pit of hell. Provided as we have the Holy Spirit in us, we have that gift. We manifest that gift. You have at least one. First Peter four ten says, "As each one of us, as each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Minister it to one another as you've received this gift. Use it. Use it not for yourself, but for the church. Not for you, but for others. You have it. Use it. Use it. Amen." Romans 12, 6 says, Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. 
you have I, 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 there are lots of scripture verses that points to the fact that we all have at least one gift. You have it. You have to use it. Why unlock your spiritual gift? Number two, because you will give account of your gifts. I've said it before. You will give account of it. You will give account. You will give account. Did you use your gift? Did you bury your gift? It's possible you're burying it. You, you just locked it. That's a possibility. That's a real possibility. Amen? Like I said before, Matthew 25, 29, for everyone who has, more will be given. More will be given. And you will have abundance. But to him who does not have, even the little you have, if you think you don't have, even the little you have will be taken away from you. Why unlock your spiritual gift? Number three, of course, it's obvious, to serve others and to build the church. To serve others, to build the church in unity. In unity, in love. I cannot overemphasize these two things well. In unity and in love. You build a church together, united, not divided, no divisions, and build in love. At some point, Paul had to, again, this same church in Corinth, he had to tell them, look, the greatest thing, the greatest gift, he had to tell them, the greatest is what? Love. He said, faith, hope, and love abide this. 1 Corinthians 13. He said, have faith, have hope, have love. But the greatest of all is love. Because, you, because to build a church, you need to love the church. To build a church, you need to love the church. Love God's people. You need to do it in love. Use your gifts in love to build the church. To serve others and build the church. Because that is the right thing to do. And Ephesians 4.12 says, For the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, and for edifying the body of Christ. That is why we need to unlock our gifts. Why we need to unlock our gifts. Amen? Now, how do we unlock these gifts? How do we unlock this gift? Number one reason, as I try to summarize, number one reason why we have how to unlock these gifts is we have to desire and yearn for these spiritual gifts. You have to desire it. You have to... Crave. You need to test for it. You need to test for it. Then you will see it. First Corinthians 14.1, Paul, again speaking to the church of Corinth, he says, pursue love and desire spiritual gifts. It's not wrong to desire them, particularly if you have them or if you want more. So pursue love and desire the spiritual gifts, but especially that you might, especially that you might prophesy. You need to desire these gifts. That's the first way to unlock this gift. Desire these gifts. Now, when you desire and test for spiritual gifts, you spend more time seeking God's guidance, praying, and manifesting these gifts. Only when you desire and test for it. You spend more time seeking God's face, asking God, which gift do I have? Trying to use these gifts. Praying. And the Lord will you know, show you the whole through the Holy Spirit, different gifts that you have. Pray in the Spirit. Pray in the Spirit and you will manifest these gifts. Number two reason, how to unlock your spiritual gifts. Number two is, you know, it's quite practical. You need to explore your passions and your strengths. Right? Let, let, let's not always be up here. Let's come down practically. How do you unlock this gift? You need to explore your passion. What are you passionate about? What, what comes naturally to you? Some of you, praying comes naturally to you. It comes naturally. You, you can realize that with a little bit more effort, with a little bit more trusting, with a little bit more leading of the Spirit, your praying can go into a different level. And you can, become, you can have a gift of healing. You don't know. You never know because you've not tried. What comes naturally to you? Some of you, teaching comes naturally to you. You want to teach the, you know, the word of God, you can teach it so perfectly. That's, that's an idea that it's possible you have the gift of teaching. You just need to cultivate it. You need to unlock it in the right way. Unlock it in the right way. Some of you, the word of wisdom comes to you. I know uh, normally all women think they have it. 
<laughs> they, all women normally have this gift of wisdom. They, 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 they know a lot of things. They know. I know. I, I'm telling you this. So I've seen it coming. You know, you always tell your husband, I've seen this coming. I know this. Is <laughs> Some of you are laughing because you know yourselves, right? <laughs> but the truth is, some of you naturally have this gift of wisdom. You have this gift that you, you see things coming from afar. Many people don't see it, but you see it because you have this divine, you know, divine ministration to you. You just see it. A lot of you have the gift of knowledge. Unusually, you have this. You need to know what your passion is. You need to know what your strengths are. You need to build on it. You need to use it, and you need to cultivate it. That is one of the ways you can unlock your spiritual gifts. And thirdly, how to unlock your spiritual gifts, as the music team come up finally, how to unlock your spiritual gifts. Number three, I've said it again, I'll say it again and again, you need to serve. You need to engage in your church. You need to serve. How do you know your passion? You know, when number two says, Find out what your passion is. Explore your passions and your strength. How do you do it if you don't do it in a garden of believers? You need to gather with believers. You need to do it in a garden of believers. Amen? You need to serve. You need to put yourself forward. You need to be, you, you, you need to have the love for the people of God, the love for the things of God, the love for the ministries of God, the love for the activities of God, and you need to put yourself out there to help, to serve, to engage in the church. That is another way you can unlock your spiritual gifts. <sighs> unlock your spiritual gifts. As I end, this is a manifestation of the Holy Spirit. To demonstrate the power that comes with the Holy Spirit, you need to know your gifts. You need to use your gifts. Don't leave it dormant. Don't leave it dormant. When you leave it dormant, it's as though you are burying it. You don't want to see it. You don't want to use it. You don't want to hear about it. And that is not what Christ wants from you. Nor from me. He expects us to use it. You have at least one gift. If the only thing you take out of this message is this, I'm happy. If the only thing you take out of this message is that you, yes, you have at least one spiritual gift, at least one, you have it. You only need to know what it is, unlock it, and use it. How do you unlock it? You need to test, you need to desire for it. You need to use it. You need to see what your strengths are. What, what are your passions? What gives you joy? What, what, what do you naturally tend to do within these gifts, of course? And you need to serve. Serve and engage in the church of God. <laughs>